Some of this stuff is pretty complex, and so I'm hoping that um, you guys will have some questions, and maybe we can have a chance to talk um, and you know talk about whatever questions you may have, and I can answer those maybe. Or Father's here, you know, he went to seminary, so he'll definitely know the answer, uh, and know it in a. <laughs> okay, thank you for that vote of confidence. Um, <laughs> So, yes, this is a very complicated topic, the first topic that we're going to talk about, and that is the Holy Trinity. And as Father alluded to in his prayer, uh, at its root, it is a mystery. Um, but up to the point where the Holy Trinity becomes a mystery, the Church has proclaimed numerous doctrines. And so the Church proclaims the doctrines, and it's our job to assent to those doctrines, to believe those doctrines, and then to recognize that ultimately the Trinity is a mystery that we can't comprehend, save for the doctrines that the church has defined. But the first thing that I want to talk to you all about is something that is sometimes missed in the class, and that is what is the whole point of doctrine? Um, obviously, this class is going to talk a lot about doctrine, and so it's important to understand why the church has the doctrine that the church has. So, I've written the creed, or portions of the Nicene Creed on the board, and unfortunately my writing is really small, um, so those of you in the back may not be able to see this. Also, I'm going to try to talk really loudly so I can get away from the microphone. So, okay. If you can't hear me, just go, hey, go like this, and then I'll know. Okay, so you'll notice that I've uh, written some Latin here, and I didn't make this up. This is actual Latin. Um, and I'm going to come back to this part. Uh, because what you're going to notice in the class as we go through the book, our Catechism for Adults book, is that we're going to be talking about each line of the Nicene Creed uh, and kind of expounding on what that line means. And so what we're going to be talking about tonight is essentially this whole first part about God the Father, what does it mean to believe in God, what does it mean that God created all things in heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. We're going to come back to that. I want to jump ahead to something that we're going to talk about much later in the RCIA class, but it's important to recognize today as we start talking about the doctrines of the church. And that is that the Nicene Creed in Latin, you'll see in the first part, it says, Credo in unum Deum. And that translates to, I believe in one God. Okay? And then you jump down after the part in the Nicene Creed that talks about Christ and the nature of Christ, the dual natures of Christ. And then you get into the portion that talks about the Holy Ghost. Then there's a portion in the section on the Holy Ghost that talks about the church. And I've kind of, there's an ellipsis here, but essentially what the creed says is, Credo unum sanctum catholicum et apostolicum ecclesium. That means I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now I didn't mess up in writing this in English. I didn't leave out an in. Now we say in in our translation now. The more literal translation would be to say, I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And that entails something slightly different than the idea that I believe in something. Okay? Presumably an atheist could believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. They could believe that a church exists and it's one holy Catholic and apostolic. What the creed says is, I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Which means not only that I believe that such a church exists, but I believe what the church teaches. And I believe that the church has that right to teach that because it is, in fact, one holy Catholic and apostolic. So that's where the doctrine comes in. Christ, as we're going to talk about when we talk about the nature of Christ and the mission of Christ and the mission of the church that he founded, Christ founded the Catholic Church to continue his work of redemption. That idea was solemnly defined at the First Vatican Council in the 1860s, late 1860s, 1870. So what does that mean? The church has three different offices that Christ has given her. That is, to teach, there's a teaching office, 
the pastoral office, basically to rule and govern. And then there's the sacerdotal office, the priestly office. So the church has three different offices. So what we're talking about when we talk about doctrine is the teaching office of the church. It's the responsibility of the church in order to bring about the redemption for all people uh, to teach everything that the people need to know in terms of faith and morals. So that's why there are such things as doctrines. Now some of these doctrines on the Holy Trinity are going to become very technical. And you might start questioning, well, why, why do I need to know this? This may or may not have any impact or bearing on your, your moral life. It may or may not have an impact on your life of piety, the sorts of prayers that you do. But I would ask you to consider what it takes to love another person. In order to love another person, you have to know them. You have to know something about them. The process of falling in love involves a mutual exchange of knowledge of, you know, maybe you date somebody, you talk about your background, where you were raised, that sort of thing. You get to know someone. That's what the church does for us in proclaiming different doctrines about God. We get to know God. We can understand more fully the nature of God. And so those are the sorts of doctrines that we're going to talk about tonight. That's going to lead us into talking about what it means for God to be a father, what it means for us to say that God made heaven and earth, etc. So now I'm going to try to run through this stuff. <laughs> I have too many books. I believe in one God. As I mentioned earlier, the idea of the Holy Trinity is a mystery. So what does it mean? Mystery has a technical definition. Well, first of all, we can say that the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is something that we could only recognize through divine revelation. Meaning, the idea that God is three persons with one divine nature is not something that you would, that's not a conclusion that you would come to by looking at nature. That's not a conclusion that reason would lead you to understand. The First Vatican Council tells us that that is something that we can only know through divine revelation. But what does it mean to say that this is a mystery? Well, think about for a second the idea that God is one God and three divine persons. Okay, we can't really wrap our heads around that. Moreover, each divine person is himself God. Those are two truths that our minds can't comprehend. And so that is a mystery. But we can understand what those terms mean, and we can say some things about what those terms mean. I want to draw your attention to this very poorly drawn triangle. Here we have the three divine persons of the Holy Trinity. This is a formulary that was popularized kind of by the Roman Catechism in the late 16th century. So we have the Father, the Son, Holy Ghost, okay? The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not the Father. And yet all three are God. So this is a pretty good diagram. This is a pretty popular diagram when considering the Holy Trinity. But what does that really mean? I'm going to throw out some different doctrinal statements here and then tell you a little bit about what they mean, okay? So we have three divine persons. They are distinct, and yet they are equal, and they have one nature. So we have a few different terms there that we need to define. What is a person? What does it mean to say the word person when you're talking about God? What does it mean to say the word nature when you're talking about God? These are things that it's important to know so that we can understand God. The nature of God is that which enables him to act as God. Well, let's think about that in terms of the three divine persons. Uh, we recognize in each of the three divine persons the capacity to act like God. So that is the nature of the three divine persons. So what is a person when you're talking about the three divine persons of God? The persons of God are those which constitute him the owner of his acts, or the owner of his nature. So the three divine persons encapsulate the one nature of God. That's all very complicated, and that's why this is a mystery. <laughs> we can't understand that. We can't wrap our heads around that. But where do we see that in Scripture? Well, it's... Oh, sorry. Can you just hit us one more time with your definition of nature of person? Sure. The nature of God is that which enables him to act like God. 
and the person of God, or the persons of God, are those which constitute him the owners, uh, owner of his acts, or the owner of his nature. So one nature, three divine persons. There's not going to be a test on this. I think the most clear example of this in the Old Testament is the creation of the world. Um, throughout various portions of the Old Testament, you will see God referring to himself through the writing of the sacred author that uh, God refers to himself in the plural. He says, let us create man in our image, that sort of thing. Um, in creation, we see the Holy Spirit over the waters of the earth, that sort of thing. So we can see the different uh, aspects of God in the creation, and it doesn't explicitly reveal the Holy Trinity. That was something that wouldn't come until Christ in the New Testament. I think it's an interesting question of why God didn't reveal the Holy Trinity to the Jewish people. Um, the church doesn't have any pronouncement on that particular issue. Um, the fathers of the church have speculated that, and this is clear from reading the Old Testament, uh, that the Jews were typically drawn, they had a tendency toward polytheism, the idea that there's more than one God. And so to reveal the Holy Trinity to the Jews would have maybe caused them to slip further into the polytheistic error. Um, and so this was something that was revealed in the person of Christ in the New Testament. So what are some examples of the Holy Trinity being revealed in the, in the New Testament? Anybody think of one? Yes, the baptism of the Lord in the Jordan. You see the, uh, the Father speaking, the Holy Spirit descending, and Christ, uh, the Son, being baptized. Any others? Christ's words, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yes, Christ's words, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Pentecost. Pentecost, very good. Um, Christ gives the mandate to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's pretty direct evidence there. Uh, the transfiguration of Christ. Uh, at the Last Supper, the discourses of the Last Supper, Christ makes the doctrine of the Trinity pretty evident. Interestingly, the word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible, so this is tradition. Uh, but it's always been the tradition of the church. It's always been the teaching of the church. From the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, all the creeds. I'm going to talk a little bit about another, the Athanasian Creed in a little bit. So what's another doctrinal statement we can make about the Holy Trinity? Well, as we see on the board, poorly written, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is not the Father or the Son. The, one of the ideas that we're getting at here is that the Trinity exists as a Trinity for one reason, because of the relational aspect of each of the persons in the Trinity to the other persons of the Trinity. And these, Father, are called the internal processions. So you see, the Son is begotten of the Father from all eternity. This is clear from Scripture, and it was made more explicit in the 4th century councils of the Church. Not only that, but the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. This was made explicitly clear in the 11th Council of Toledo in the year 675, and the Council of Lyon in 1274. This relational aspect is, I think, best described by St. Augustine and later adopted by the Council of Trent in 1545 through 1563. And so pay attention to what the Council of Trent says here, because I think this is the most common explanation of the different uh, relational aspects of the divine persons to one another. God is spirit, and the first act of spirit is to know and to understand. God knows himself from all eternity, and that knowing himself brought forth full knowledge of himself. And that wasn't a passing idea, but that brought forth his own image, a living person, the Son. So God knowing himself is God the Father. God known to himself is God the Son. God the Father and God the Son loved each other from all eternity beholding in each the supreme goodness of the divinity. That mutual love between the Father and the Son is their very essence, substance, a living person, the Holy Spirit. 
So, said more simply, the Father and the Son love each other from all eternity, and the love of the Father and the Son manifests itself into a living person, and that's the Holy Spirit. This is one of those doctrines that is not just important in terms of faith. I think that this really impacts the relation that we have to God because it helps us to see a little bit more clearly how we can be drawn up into God ourselves. Uh, once we avail ourselves of the sacraments of the church and once we have that sanctifying grace that I'm going to talk about a little bit more later, we become temples of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. And so... Through that indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we are drawn up into the mystery of the Trinity. We are God's own adopted children. We are taking part in the mutual love between the Father and the Son by having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so this is the love of God. Everybody looks pretty confused. Okay, so we are almost done with this part. Um, so another doctrinal statement. Each divine person is one and the same God. Each divine person is in the others. This is what Jean was saying, I and the Father are one, according to, the God, to Christ in the Gospel of John. But this raises an interesting point about the way that we talk about God, and I think this is important to mention. This is the idea of appropriations. You've probably noticed in your life and in talking to people that sometimes we'll ascribe certain actions of God to maybe one of the divine persons to the exclusion of the others. So, for instance, we might talk about God the Father being involved in creation, uh, but we don't mention necessarily the action of the Holy Spirit or of the Son. Um, sometimes we'll do the same thing for the Holy Spirit. We'll say, there's, well, there's an action of the Holy Spirit, and we won't talk about the action of the Father and the Son. This is not necessarily a bad thing, because Christ himself taught us to do this in the Scriptures. And this is the idea of appropriation. That is, that the properties and activities common to all three persons are attributed to an individual person of the Trinity. So even though we're saying that God the Son or God the Father is doing this or that particular action, because each divine person is one and the same God, they're all in each other, the entire Trinity is acting. But it's okay for us in most circumstances to ascribe a certain action to maybe one uh, divine person. So what are some other doctrines that we can say about the Holy Trinity? Well, as I was alluding to, the Holy Trinity, each of the divine persons are co-equal. God the Father is not better than God the Son or God the Holy Ghost. God the Son and God the Holy Ghost are not subordinate to the Father. Uh, some people, I think, have that idea, and that is an incorrect idea. Each of the three divine persons is equal. They're also, also co-eternal. Each divine person being God obviously exists from all eternity. They are co-majestic, they are uncreated, each is infinite. If you really want to talk a little bit more about this, you could read the Athanasian Creed which goes into a, a lot of detail about it. Um, this is a, a pretty old creed of the church. In fact, it's so old no one knows who wrote it or when it was written. Um, it was not written by St. Athanasius. But if you really want to look at what the church teaches about the doctrines of the Holy Trinity, that would be the place to look. And as you can see in my fancy book here, it takes up a whole, ha a whole page, so it's very long. The interesting thing about the Holy Trinity and the reason why I'm going to stop talking about doctrines of the Holy Trinity is because in the Roman Catechism, that's the, council, the uh, catechism that was created after the Council of Trent, uh, ordered by Pope Pius V, the, the Catechism, the Roman Catechism cautions priests and catechists from going into too subtle an investigation of the mysteries of the Holy Trinity for fear that the people will get confused and fall away from the, uh, fall away from the belief in the Trinity. So the, the Roman Catechism says that the laity should not engage in too subtle an investigation of the mysteries of the Holy Trinity. Instead, we should be satisfied by the assurance that faith gives because this is a truth that's revealed to us by God. So as I sometimes say when I'm meditating on an idea, whether it's be this mystery or some other mystery of the church, and I think, I don't understand this. How can I believe what I don't understand? I remind myself that St. Thomas Aquinas was much, much smarter than I am, and he believed it. 
And so I believe it because St. Thomas Aquinas believed it. <laughs> I don't know each of you personally, but I'm willing to bet that St. Thomas Aquinas was much smarter than any of you, or all of you put together. And so I would advise the same route, and to put our faith in the great St. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, any of the great saints of the church, and simply uh, to believe it because this is what God wants us to believe. We don't have to understand it, so let's move on. It's a mystery, yes. We can't understand it. And we'll drive ourselves crazy. So. I've used with, um, with kids, older kids, a chemical example like water. You know, it's a solid liquid and gas, but it's all water. The chemical formula doesn't change, even though the physical attributes might. It's still the same chemical formula, the same water, but it exists in three forms. That's <coughs> it helps some, except that that's actually the heresy of modalism. Yes, and so we should not believe that. <laughs> it's a way to try to get a handle on it. That, that Do not true. believe what Gene says, because Gene is a heretic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, you actually make a good point. I think that that is a way to get a handle on it. But the thing that that, that shows us, and that's a great example, and I knew someone was going to say it, which is why I made sure to look up the definition of modalism before I came. <laughs> And um, it's a great example because that is the example that, that shows not what we should believe about the Trinity, but that when we engage in too subtle an investigation of the Trinity, when we try to pin it down, when we try to say, this is what the mystery means, we're always going to be in heresy, okay? We're always going to be wrong because it's a mystery, and you can't, by definition, you cannot define the mystery. To define it is to be incorrect. Um, but that is a good way to think about it, just not, you know, as a it's source of it. <laughs> Yeah, it's an, it is an analogy. Yeah. See, I told my wife before we came here that I was not going to use the word heretic, and then Gene, you made me. <laughs> yes. I have been used that also, but yeah. I have also explained, you know, you can't have ice water and, and at vapor same, at the same time, and you right. can't have the trinity that's right. the same thing all right. that's, And that's the problem, is that... Um, it, the, the Trinity is not God expressing Himself in three different ways. For God truly is three different persons. And it's all, not all yeah. at the same time. Right. What was, the other, oh. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> the other thing that I think is not an explanation, but it's an excellent illustration, is what Father Cuddy used to do in his classes when he had the three matchsticks or the three straws, and he would light each of them and show that the light burns separately. Or when you put all three of them together and hold them in one little bundle, there's one light. They're all part of the same light, and yet they can be separated because all three exist independently. Well, not independently, but I mean they're all in existence at the same time. You don't have to extinguish one to to light the other. Yeah. And uh, that's explain a, to us if that's a heresy. That is. That's the heresy of tritheism. <laughs> <laughs> but you put them all together and they burn. Yes, but you can take them apart, and they're, they're different. <laughs> okay. As I said, I don't think that's an explanation, it's just it is an illustration. It is, yes, and these are both illustrations. Yeah, I don't, I'm not... <laughs> What's that? Yeah, that, that, the, the matchsticks would be... The matchsticks would be tritheism. People will use the... People will have the clover, that's modalism. You know, yeah. Yeah, so, what was your... What was your thing? Modalism, M-O-D-A-L-I-S-M, and it's mode, is it like mode, like... So you were saying transmodalism. Was I? Were you? No, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't meaning to, anyway. That's when you hear it. That, yeah. <laughs> That's when the modes move, all right. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, yeah. All right, so I have a lot to cover, so let's not do too much here. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about creation. So we're going up here. 
I believe in the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. So we're going to break that down, but I first want to just point out something we just talked about, the idea of appropriation. Here in the Nicene Creed, we are ascribing to the Father the work of creation, yet clearly we all know that this is actually the work of all three persons of the Holy Trinity because they can't be separated. So that's a good example of appropriation. Now, even though it says invisible, last, I want to talk about that first because I don't want to spend an hour talking about angels. <laughs> Angels are intellectual beings created by God and in their nature are of a higher dignity than man. So saith the Fourth Lateran Council and the First Vatican Council. There were good angels sent by God to help man, according to the Fourth Lateran Council. We know some of those from Scripture. We know about Saints Michael, Gabriel, Raphael. We know that each person has a guardian angel that accompanies them from birth, according to the Summa Theologica. In fact, the Feast of the Guardian Angels is October the 2nd, although it's abrogated this year because that's a Sunday, the day of Father David's first Latin Mass at 2 o'clock. High Mass. Um, in addition to the good angels, there were fallen angels. They were also created by God, and they were created good. But they became evil through their own fault. Now, obviously, I wasn't there when the angels fell, so I can't tell you exactly how that went down. Um, but we do know that the angels at some point were given a test, and they failed. Some of them failed. I think it's one of the small t traditions of the church that the saving work of God, meaning that the idea that God the Son was going to take on human flesh and live in the world amongst his creation. Some people believe that this plan was revealed to Satan and the other fallen angels, and they thought, well, this is not a good plan. This is... This is wrong for God to go dwell amongst his people. And since they disagree with the plan, they were disobedient. That's not something we have to believe. That's just one possible explanation. Like I said, I wasn't there. No one in the church was there. It doesn't reveal to us why the angels fell. And so therefore, the church hasn't given us anything specific that we are obliged to believe in this regard. Milton did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think I have time. So I'm going to tell you about the... People are concerned about uh, demons and devils, and we should be concerned about these things. Uh, but we should also understand that there are certain things that, that God allows demons to do, and there are certain things that God does not allow the demons to do. So the demons cannot produce any truly supernatural phenomena. They cannot create anything, because only God can create. They cannot bring a dead person back to life, although they could produce the illusion of doing so. They cannot make truly prophetic predictions, because only God knows the future. They cannot know the secrets of a person's mind or heart. But what can they do? They can produce corporeal or imaginative visions, sense visions, but not things that are real. They can falsify ecstasy. They can instantaneously cure illnesses that have been caused by diabolical influence. They can produce the stigmata. They can simulate miracles and the phenomena of levitation and bilocation. They can make people or objects seem to disappear by interfering with a person's sight or vision. They can cause a person to hear sounds or voices. They can cause a person to speak in tongues. They can declare a fact which is hidden or distant. So we are right to be concerned about the existence of the fallen angels amongst us. But we're also right to rely on the protection of our guardian angels and the other good angels. People do not become angels when they die. Some people believe that. So just throw that out there. But we do venerate the angels just like we venerate the saints. We pray to the angels just like we pray to the saints. I'm not giving a class on the veneration and prayers to saints, so I'm not going to talk about that anymore other than to say that the Council of Trent says that we should venerate angels and therefore it's true. Any questions about angels, please do not ask them. <laughs> now, go, if you have any questions about angels, go ahead. Okay, moving on to the visible creation. Visible creation. God is the maker of heaven and earth. I'm going to focus on earth, because that's where we are right now. <sighs> Nothing? No. Okay. All right. So, so God created all that exists ex nihilo, out of nothing, according to the First Vatican Council. God did not have to create the world. 
Moreover, God did not have to create this world. God, have, God could have created any world he pleased to create. According to the Synod of Cologne in 1860, creation is a work of divine wisdom. It wasn't an accident that God created the world. In creating the world, God was motivated by goodness. So what are the purposes of creation, keeping all those things in mind? The primary purpose of creation, according to the First Vatican Council, is God's external glory and splendor manifested in his creatures. Okay. What's the secondary purpose of creation according to the First Vatican Council? So that man could win everlasting happiness for himself. So those two things don't necessarily mean too much to us at this point. We would have to really meditate on what that means, but I want to tell you what the First Vatican Council says about that putting those two things together, and I think that if you really thought about this, you would recognize that this statement that I'm about to quote to you really shows the goodness and the love that God has in creating the world. So this is a quote from the First Vatican Council. God drew creatures from nothing, not to increase his happiness, not to gain anything, but to manifest his perfection by the blessings he bestows on creatures. So that's... I mean, that's a loving creator. God didn't have to create us. He didn't have to create us as we are. He didn't have to create us in a way that we are destined for the beatific vision of his presence in heaven. He didn't have to create us with reason. We know that. We can look at the animals. God could have chosen to do any number of things. He could have not created us. We could all just as easily not exist. And yet God chose to do these things because God is good and because he loves us. He wants us to give Him glory and to win everlasting happiness for ourselves. Are you changing tapes? No? Okay. So I, I, now is the time because I'm going to drink this. Okay. All right. Now God is all good. We know that. Because that's one of the divine attributes of God. God created the world good. How do we know that? Well, the Council of Florence tells us, but also we can read that in creation. With each different thing that God created, he declared that it was good. And so we live in a world that is good. And the church does not teach that material things are evil. Material things are good. Material things, like anything else, can be misused, and therefore they can become evil to us subjectively. They could be an occasion of sin or something like that. But material things in themselves are good. Not only does God create us, and as I said, he could have chosen not to do so, but at each moment, God keeps us in existence. God protects and guides everything that he's created. God is behind each action that we have, even though we may turn away from the way that we should go. God keeps us in existence, and he helps us to act. If God forgot about us, if he could do that, we could all cease to exist right now. But in his love, he keeps us in existence. So anytime we talk about creation, we have to talk about evolution. And... The church, in her wisdom, has given us certain guidelines for things that we are allowed to believe and things that we are not allowed to believe. The most definitive statement on the creation of the world, and let me just say here that I'm going to talk about first about the creation of everything that's not people, because people have a special creation. We know that from the different creation stories in Genesis. Pope St. Pius X in 1909 approved a writing from the Pontifical Biblical Commission. And that writing tells us basically what we're to believe in terms of creation. So here, here it goes. Genesis chapters 1 through 3 narrate real events, not myths, allegories, legends, or symbols of religious truth. So as Catholics, we're obliged to believe that Genesis chapters 1 through 3 narrate real events. Moreover, according to the Pontifical Biblical Commission, did I mention that this happened in 1909? Okay, that's, that's when this happened, okay. Um, God created all things in the beginning of time. 
again, um, we're going to talk about the creation of man, but the Pontifical Biblical Commission had more to say about that. In terms of the creation of the material world, this, the sacred writer relating to us the creation of the world in Genesis is not relating science. The church does not oblige us to believe that everything that's written in Genesis is scientifically accurate. The six days mentioned in, in the creation account in Genesis need not be interpreted literally. So there are two different interpretations of the six days of creation and uh, as set forth in Genesis. And I'm going to... So I'm not going to draw this whole thing, but I'm going to just tell you guys what it means. So in, in Genesis, in order to explain the division of the creation story, we can kind of look at it this way. There's three different realms, dark, water, and earth. Okay? And these are the days of creation, one through six. God rested on the seventh day, we all know that. Day one, God dealt with the dark. And he created two different regions, day and night. And then we see a correlation on the fourth day. God creates the sun for day, and he creates the moon and the stars for night. The second and the fifth day deal with water. On the second day, he creates sea and sky. And then on this fifth day, he creates their occupants, the fishes and the birds. The third and the sixth days deal with, on the third day, the land under the water and the land over the water, the division there. Now the sixth day doesn't talk about anything occupying the land under the water because nothing could possibly occupy such a thing. But the sixth day is the creation of the animals and man for the land over the water. So there's a parallel here between the regions, the divisions, and then the occupants of each division. So that's the first interpretation. The second interpretation is that the six days present a broad chronological order that interestingly enough appears to agree with the scientific accounts that we have now. So you have the creation of day and night, the creation of sea and sky, and then you have land popping up, and you have the sun and the moon, and then you all of a sudden have fishes and birds, and then you have animals and man. So there's a movement forward in those things. Which seems to raise the question, does that mean that we can believe in evolution? Well, we can believe, as Catholics, we can believe in a theistic evolution of the earth. Catholics cannot believe in Darwinian evolution. We can't believe in atheistic evolution, obviously, because we're theists. We can't believe in Darwinian evolution because Darwinian evolution presupposes atheism, essentially. Uh, and if you really want to have a good reading on this, there's a whole chapter in this awesome book called Apologetics and Catholic Doctrine that talks all about the scientific evidence for evolution or lack thereof. And I'm not going to go into all that because I don't have time, frankly, but um, it is an interesting account. You know, St. Augustine pretty thought a lot of this. Right. Doctrine of rationalist, rational seeds that yeah. were planted in creation at any time they developed. You know, exactly. Yeah. He goes into a lot of detail, but he, he kind of pre-thought a lot of this. Yeah. He saw evidence for the. You looked in my outline, didn't you? No, but it's, uh, it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> it is, yeah. What he was saying is that St. Augustine, in the year, he lived in 354 to 430, okay? He thought of these this idea essentially of theistic evolution. That's just insane to me. So that's one reason why I put my faith in the thinkers like St. Augustine and, and St. Thomas Aquinas. So what does theistic evolution of the earth mean? And again, we're not talking about man. We're talking about 
things other than man, material things other than man. Well, we cannot deny God is the cause and creator of all things. We could believe in the idea that God created an earth and he allowed the earth to mature over time and all of a sudden there's little you know, bacteria and whatnot. I don't know, there's science people here, so I don't want to go into all this, but, you know, stuff comes out of nothing. But um, I'm not a scientist, so I can't really shoot down that idea. All I can say is that, as far as I know, no scientist has yet been able to create something that lives out of something that is dead. Uh, and so, until scientists do that, you know, what ifs. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to talk about the evolution of man. So we can, we can believe that. As Catholics, we can believe theistic evolution. God must be the cause and creator, though. All right. Something that is quite popular these days is for people to hypothesize about the age of creation. Some people say, well, the earth is like 6,000 years old because the Bible says that. Some people say the earth is like 60 billion years old because scientists say that. Jurassic Park says the earth is like 600 billion years old because Michael Crichton wrote that. Okay, thank you in the back. <laughs> Make sure that gets on the microphone for the camera. Okay. Um, the church does not tell us how old the earth is, and neither does scripture. And why is that? Because it doesn't matter. The age of the earth has absolutely no bearing on faith and morals. And what did I say at the beginning, everyone? The church's doctrine deals with faith and morals. Everything else that we talked about impinges on the nature of God. What does God mean in relation to us? What does God mean in relation to himself? How does God relate to his creation? The age of the earth has no bearing on that. If the earth is 6,000 years old, it doesn't matter. If the earth is 600 billion years old, it doesn't matter. Either way, I'm pretty impressed by the way God was able to make it. Because I could not have made it in infinity. Okay. Let's talk about the creation of man. Well, let me, let me ask. Any questions about the, the creation of all things other than man? <laughs> What's that? Um, whose days? I mean, like days of man is just sort of the, the earth certainly rotating. That's a day for us. I mean, whose days are quote unquote? Because I've always had this argument with people, and I'm like, yeah, why don't you just say they're both? Like, I mean, billions of our years make the day for God. I just, well, the <laughs> answer is. The almost thing when I've been thinking since I was a kid, and I'm kind of. Yeah. That is a oh, I, what, oh, oh, the question is uh, what is meant by the word day um, in this creation account which is a great question uh, the answer is because the church allows us to believe in theistic evolution or we could, uh, we, could, we could choose to believe in an actual human day if we wanted to we could choose to believe that a, one day for God is a billion days for us, a billion years or something like that Either one. The church has not solemnly declared this. And as I said earlier, the church allows us, we have to believe that Genesis 1 through 3 narr narrate real events. But remember that they're not narrating it, the sacred author is not writing with science in mind. Okay? Um, so it narrates real events, not a myth, but we're not obliged to believe that it's narrating a scientific proposition. Okay? Um, so when you reconcile those two things, it really leaves us to choose. Um, so I don't really think that it matters. I mean, I, as a former atheist myself, I know people love to throw that out there and to argue that uh, Genesis is inconsistent with itself because God creates light twice and that sort of thing. I mean, people have known that since it was written. <laughs> um, it frankly does not matter. Um, so the, the, the idea that the church has is that we were going to give a literal definition to the text until it presents itself that we have to use some other interpretive method. Okay? Um, so you're allowed to believe that it's six human days or really whatever you want to believe. But you can't believe something that contradicts Catholic dogma in other ways. So you couldn't believe that you know, uh, someone other than God was acting on those days, for example. So yeah, so, yeah great question. I mean, also love the part where you said it really. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and really think about that because it really does not matter. Everything is bracketed by God. Creation, <coughs> time, evolution, 
all of that astrophysics is grounded <coughs> on both ends by God's creative act. So it really doesn't matter. Everything inside the brackets really doesn't matter. Ultimately. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, 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 I, I swear to you, if, if I could even be close to wrapping my mill around this and getting anywhere near it, I would just explode, literally, physically. <laughs> So, like you said, it doesn't matter. Just go with it. Yeah. It matters, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. If you're a physicist, it matters. Yeah. You're a physicist, you're out, right? <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Okay, so the creation of man. As Catholics, we have to believe that man uh, is specially created by God. And we have to believe that God directly created the soul of Adam. The soul of Adam. And... According to the Fifth Lateran Council in the early 16th century, we believe that God directly creates the soul of every person out of nothing. Now, man has two essential parts, the body and the soul. And they form an intrinsic natural unit. So what does that mean? Good question, Mark. What does that mean? Well, sometimes we have a tendency to think of our soul as kind of the pilot of our body, the ship. That is not what it means. Uh, the soul is eternal, but the body is also made for the resurrection of the dead. Right? Um, the soul isn't just merely a, a pilot inside of a ship. They are intrinsically connected. A person doesn't exist until the soul and the body are you know, together. They're, they're brought together as a unit. So with that in mind, the church doesn't teach and never has taught that the body is evil. Because it's a material thing that God created good. But... We're going to talk about original sin in a second and see how that impacts that. So with regard to the creation of man, what else do we have to believe? Well, according to the Pontifical Biblical Commission, again, from yep, 1909, we have to believe that woman was created out of man. And we have to believe that human, the human race, the entire human race, stems from a single human pair. So what does this mean in terms of whether Catholics can properly believe in the evolution of man? <coughs> well, Catholics may believe in the theistic evolution of man's body. Catholics cannot believe that in, the, in any sort of evolution of man's soul. Because as I said, each soul is immediately and directly created by God out of nothing. Souls have not existed from all eternity. Souls are immediately created. In Humani Generis, Pope Pius XII, around World War II, he set out boundaries for our belief in the evolution of humans. And it's an interesting uh, parameters he set up. We are not allowed to believe in polygenism, meaning we are not allowed to believe that man descended from multiple groups. As I said, we have to believe that man descended from a single human pair. And we may not believe in the evolution of souls. Uh, now, as I said, we're allowed to believe that man evolved and that in the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve, created out of the first man, uh, that God implanted the soul in Adam and Eve. We could believe that there was evolution up to that point and then right when humans uh, were about to come into existence, God implants the soul in Adam and Eve. In order for that to be true, human, the first human, Adam, would have had to at some point been born of an animal. Which means that God would have put a human soul into the womb of an animal. And so the idea that the spiritual soul was created in an animal body is foreign to Holy Writ and the fathers of the church. Man has an elevated dignity above animals due to being created in the image and likeness of God and the incarnation of Christ. So it's philosophically illogical to believe in the evolution of man in that way. But Catholics are still are allowed to believe that. The church hasn't solemnly defined that. I would posit to you, however, that it is philosophically illogical to believe that. But if you want to believe that, knock yourself out. So man is created in the image and likeness of God. What does that mean? Well, there's a few different ways that we're created in the image of God. We have a soul that's a simple, immortal substance, which is a shade of God. 
Our soul has faculties of intelligence and will that's very similar to the nature of God. God has shared with us his kingship and made us lords of the world. And I think the most important way in which human beings are made in the image and likeness of God is that we share uh, the same human body that Christ, the Son of God, shared in the Incarnation. So that's another way that we're made in the image and likeness of God. Any questions about the creation of man? I got a couple more pages, so I don't know if you want to change it or not. This is going a little bit faster than I thought it would. All right. Now I'm going to talk about original sin and the fall of man. And this is, understanding this I think is pivotal to understanding the necessity of Christ and the incarnation, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, the death and resurrection, the founding of the church, the sacramental system of the church, and basically everything that you're going to learn throughout the rest of the class hinges on an understanding of original sin. And so, with that, I will try to explain this. The Council of Trent in the 16th century tells us the following. God gave Adam sanctifying grace and immunity from death when he created him. By sin, Adam lost these gifts and became an enemy of God, a slave of the devil, in soul and body. Adam transmitted his guilt and its evil consequences to all his posterity, us. Man has not lost and continues to not have lost his free will. So what is sanctifying grace? Sanctifying grace is the grace that caused Adam and Eve to be in a state of original justice. That means that God himself dwelt in their souls. He was united to them. And in the original design for creation, had the fall not occurred, Adam and Eve were to undergo, and, and all human beings, their posterity, would have undergone a short probation followed by painless entry into heaven. Because Adam and Eve were given other gifts called the preternatural gifts. They were given freedom from irregular desires bodily immortality, freedom from suffering, knowledge of natural and supernatural truths infused by God. That sounds a lot like what heaven would be like, and that's the state of original justice that we would have found ourselves in had it not been for the fall. And that would have been a pretty good way to live, I would think. And I want, to note, I want you to notice that the last thing is a knowledge of natural and supernatural truths infused by God. This means that Adam was not a simpleton. Adam had knowledge that far surpasses our knowledge. He had knowledge of God in a very direct way. Uh, he had knowledge of the material world in a very real and heady way, I would say, an advanced knowledge that we lack as a result of original sin now. That's important because science would have us believe now that you know, they've got us thinking that man has evolved over time and all this. So our natural thought is to think that, well, the first people were probably really stupid, you know, banging clubs against other clubs to make fire and stuff like that. No. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, were not simpletons. Because why? God would not have allowed such an important choice, i.e., whether to be subject to the temptation to someone that had, did not have the intellectual faculties to shoulder such a burden. That's illogical. It would not have happened. And God infused the natural truths and the supernatural truths into Adam and Eve. So what happened? Well, we all know the story about the serpent and the crawling around and there's some fruit and a tree and don't eat that or you'll die and they eat it and it turns out they don't die. You know, how are we going to believe that? What aspects of that should we believe? What aspects of that do we have to believe in order to call ourselves Catholic? What does the Catholic faith teach us? Back to the Pontifical Biblical Commission of 1909. As a doctrine of faith, we must believe that the first man received a command from God to test his obedience. 
this is an interesting point. What would have happened if Adam and Eve hadn't fallen? What if they had made the correct choice? So I'm anxious to hear your reply. Well, actually that's pretty close. Every subsequent generation would have been subjected to a similar choice. Every subsequent generation would have had an opportunity to be subject to the same sort of fall. That's logical. Think about it. Church teaches that, so, you know, believe it. So the first man received a command from God to test his obedience. These are the things that we have to believe about the, the story of the fall of man. Through the temptation of the devil who took the form of a serpent, he transgressed the divine commandment. So we have, to, we have to believe that. We're obligated to believe that. Our first parents were deprived of the original condition of their original condition of innocence. Okay. We're also obliged to believe in the promise of a redeemer. Now, aside from these things that I've just mentioned about the story of the fall, Catholics can believe in any interpretation of the story of the fall of man that doesn't conflict with Catholic principles. So the church does not teach us that it was an apple or a papaya or a banana or whatever certain fruit. We don't have to believe in any certain fruit. That's not a matter of faith. Why? Because it doesn't matter. That's the whole key to the doctrine thing. So when you think about this, okay, so Adam has these infused, this infused knowledge of nature and of God. And God says, don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or you will die. And so our original parents make the bad decision under the temptation of the devil and they do that and they don't die. A physical death. But they die a spiritual death. What in the world? Why, why such a harsh punishment to lose the gifts of God, to lose sanctifying grace, to lose their entitlement to heaven, to lose their freedom from irregular desires, to lose their freedom from suffering? Why does all this hinge on the eating of a fruit? Doesn't that seem like a harsh punishment? In actuality, the fall, the choice of Adam and Eve, is the most grievous sin. Why? Adam and Eve had an infused knowledge of nature and God. God himself impressed on Adam the gravity of the offense by telling him, you will surely die if you eat. This is not like, oh, I'm praying and I feel like maybe the Holy Ghost is telling me something deep in my soul. No, God said, I'm here. You know me because we have a very good relationship because I've just created you. He told Adam directly. The very fact that this was a very easy command to obey. It's not like go do something. It's simply don't do something. Don't do something very simple. Don't eat this fruit. Adam acted with cool reason on full deliberation showing the calculated malice of his sin. He thought about it. He knew it was bad and he did it. You'll find out later that those are actually the qualifications to make a sin a mortal sin for us these days. Why is it harsh? Adam sought to be like God, to be his own director and attain perfect happiness by his own enlightenment and unaided effort. Doesn't that sound like us? We do that all the time, and that's a mortal sin, right? Adam sinned as the representative of the human race. Not on his own behalf, as a representative of the human race. That's pretty heavy, right? So we can see, when we really deliberate on the fall of man, that this is not a, a punishment that does not fit the crime. This is God's infinite justice being carried out. So there's still a question, though, of, you know, why does this sin, why does this cause original sin to us? And that's a very good question. You'll notice that our human nature is transmitted to us through natural generation. We get our human nature from our parents, and they got their human nature from their parents, and so on, uh, back to the beginning. And so original sin is transmitted just like human nature. It's transmitted through the flesh. I'm going to take a drink of my coffee now, Doug.
And that's the story of the time I was eaten by a shark. Now, um, that's the best thing I could come up with off the top of my head, I promise you. I was thinking, like, the whole time, what am I going to say? And it involved a shark. A shark, yeah. I've never even met a shark. Anyway. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Original sin. Uh, so original sin is transmitted just like human nature through the flesh. Now, as I was reading about this, uh, I was, you know, I came across what I think is a very good analogy. And as far as I can tell, unlike the analogies expressed earlier, not a heretical analogy. So, um, so compare this idea to dew drops that appear in the night on a poisonous plant. The dew drops are our soul. They're pure. They're created out of nothing by God. And yet they appear on the poisonous surface of the plant, our body. And so that's kind of the relationship between our, our weak flesh that's a result of our, the original sin to our pure soul that's created by nothing, or out of nothing by God. So through the flesh, we lost uh, dominion over our bodily inclinations. Our flesh is now in a state of rebellion against our spirit. We have derived the flesh through natural generation, and every person in the history of the world, except the Blessed Virgin Mary, is born with original sin. Now this is a different thing, this original sin, from actual sin. So. Uh, you need to keep those things straight in your mind. And original sin is remitted through baptism, and we're going to talk about that. So original sin, unlike actual sin, does not, uh, it's not as a result of something that we've done. We're born with original sin, and we can't help it. So what is the effect of original, or what is the result of our loss of the sanctifying grace that we had when we were originally created in Adam? Well, the most important thing we lost is the sanctifying grace. According to the General Council of Lyon and the Council of Florence and the tradition teaching of the church from the beginning, souls departing life, meaning people who die in the state of original sin, are excluded from heaven. That's a defined dogma of the Catholic Church. And that is a harsh teaching. Of course, there are nuances that eventually we'll talk about. Um, there's a question about what happened. Well, what happens, uh, Mark, what happens to unbaptized babies, for example? Unbaptized children? Unbaptized people? Well, I don't know. I've never been, I've never met one after they died. And so we don't know the answer to that question. Uh, what we do know is that God is merciful. But what we also know is that Christ told us that baptism is necessary to enter heaven. And this is the teaching of the church. Theologians have speculated, and this idea is out of fashion, the idea of limbo, which is not purgatory, but it's a, a, a theological and philosophical construct that explains a potential state for the unbaptized children. Obviously, people who, who die before they're able to receive baptism. That's something that Catholics could choose to believe, and that's the traditional teaching of the church. No reason why we shouldn't believe that. Um, you could choose to not have any opinion on it. What we can't believe is we can't let ourselves slip into universalism because universalism defeats religion. We can't believe that everybody gets saved automatically regardless of anything. Okay? God is infinitely just. In addition to the uh, concept of limbo dealing with unbaptized children, we have various con uh, uh, theological ideas and teachings in the church. These are like baptism by desire, baptism by blood. Uh, and that's a little bit beyond the scope of this class. The thing to keep in mind here is that sanctifying grace makes the soul just and gives the person who is in the state of sanctifying grace a claim to the inheritance of heaven, according to the Council of Trent. And so when we die in a, without the sanctifying grace, for example, if we died without receiving the sacrament of baptism, so we never received sanctifying grace in the first place, we were never made just in the eyes of God, that's a problem. We could go to hell as a result of that. If we die with mortal sin on our soul, mortal sin takes away the sanctifying grace that we have after baptism, and we die, we could go to hell. Because we don't have the sanctifying grace that makes us and gives us a claim to the inheritance of heaven. 
This is the teaching of the church. So you'll see when we talk about the church's sacramental system and the sacrifice of Christ, that our goal as Catholics is to live in a state of grace, a state of sanctifying grace. The way that we do that is by availing ourselves of the grace given to us in the sacraments. Through baptism, through confession, through the reception of the Holy Eucharist. Again, that's beyond the scope of the class. So what are the other effects of original sin? Well, aside from death and suffering and ignorance, which are all bad things, one of the chief effects is concupiscence. Now, what is concupiscence? Concupiscence is our rebellious passions, attracting us powerfully to sin. So I'm sure that we can all recognize concupiscence in our lives. Uh, so original sin doesn't cause us to sin, but it causes us to be drawn to the things that are bad for us. St. Paul talks about this. Why do I do the things that I hate, even though I know that I hate them, instead of doing the things that I love and the things that I should do? Well, original sin, concupiscence, that's why. We struggle against this in our lives. This is also a reason for the church's sacramental system. The sacramental theology of the Eucharist, for example. We receive grace, not sanctifying grace, because to receive the Eucharist we have to already be in a state free from mortal sin, right? So we have to be in a state of sanctifying grace. But the Eucharist gives us a different sort of grace called actual grace. And what that does is helps us fight against our concupiscence. And so when you encounter very saintly people on earth, there are people who are acting in accordance with the will of God. But they're not free from concupiscence because as long as we remain in the flesh, we can never be free from this drawing, being drawn to sin, being drawn from our passions, being drawn away from the things that we should do. So there's a lot of different words that um, people will use to describe our human nature now after the fall. Some of them are more accurate than others, and some of them are just downright wrong. Our human nature is not corrupted or depraved. We're still, even though we are in a state of original sin, we're still capable of doing good acts in ourselves. Even if we don't have the sanctifying grace, we could still, through our own weakness, and, or I should say, despite our own weakness, do things that are good. We could attain natural goods. We could attain virtue. There are very virtuous people in the world who have never been baptized. There are very virtuous people in the world who are not Catholic. So our human nature is not corrupted or depraved. I'm thinking of the... Uh, what's that hymn that talks about saving a wretched... What's that song? Amazing, Amazing Grace. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That is not a Catholic hymn. Catholics do not believe that we are wretched, and so therefore, Amazing Grace is not not a Catholic, not a Catholic hymn. Right, right. So we should not we should probably not sing those hymns in mass. <laughs> but the total, total the, the view on total depravity. I'm a former Presbyterian minister. The view on total depravity that is the biggest difference between Protestantism and Catholicism in terms of their view of sin. That is, that is the big one. Say yeah, that again. I'll, I'll kind of elaborate on that so we can get the whole the thing. The concept yeah. of total depravity, which is a Calvinist doctrine, means that man is totally depraved and incapable of doing good without the grace of Christ. Uh, that is the biggest difference between Catholicism and Protestantism is that doctrine of the image of God. Protestants believe the image of God was totally shattered in the fall. Nothing of it remains in us. It is only restored by Christ in his redemption. The Catholic Church believes that we retain some of the image of God. It's tainted, it's shady, it's foggy, we can't see it, but it's there. There's something in us that allows us to receive his grace. And that is a huge difference and one of the biggest bones of contention between right. Protestants and Catholics. And especially in Eastern Catholicism, but this is also true in the Latin church, uh, the Roman church, whatever you want to call it, uh, is an idea that goes along with that, which is the idea of uh, divinization. So um, 
one of the reasons why we want to stay in a state of grace and receive the sacraments regularly, even though we're in a state of grace, we want to continue to, to you know, get the grace, the actual grace that we need that helps us in our day-to-day -day lives so that we can become more like God. Uh, and if you're totally depraved, you can't do that. Uh, instead, you, you have different... I mean, I don't want to go into the Protestant theologies. I've never been Protestant. Never will be. But... Um, you know, you have ideas like the, the covering up of our sins by Christ and things like that. No, that's not what Catholics believe. Catholics believe that the sacrifice of Christ gives us the merit to become more like Him. Uh, and this gets very complicated because I only have seven minutes left. In the hymnology, hide me, rock of ages. Yeah, yeah. Cover me with thy hand. I mean, it's all right there. And those are big differences. Yeah, they are big differences. Theological differences. Yeah. Right. And that, that actually brings me to my final point which is we must believe in the promise of a Redeemer. Now, as I said, baptism is necessary to restore the sanctifying grace that we lost in the fall, but it does not restore the other things. We're still subject to concupiscence, death, suffering, a lack of knowledge infused of the supernatural and of the natural. But you will see that in the saving death and resurrection of Christ, those things are given a new meaning. Suffering is given meaning and purpose. Death is given a different perspective and meaning. We are able, through the church and our teachings, the doctrine, to uh, come closer to God through understanding and, and trying to understand the supernatural and things like that. So that leads us right into what I think we're going to be talking about next time. Not me, thankfully, because it took me forever to prepare this talk. Uh, but uh, next time we're going to start talking about the Son. I believe in, in one Lord, Jesus Christ. And so that is where the, the restoration of the things, uh, of the consequences of the fall begins. So that's what we're going to talk next time. So let's open it up to questions. Questions, questions, questions. So y'all believe that anyone from a Catholic is going to hell? Y'all believe that? Is that your philosophy? No. no. That is a great question. Like. <laughs> no, the church teaches that, um, yes, extra ecclesium nola salus, right? Yeah. Outside the church, there is no salvation. That is true. Outside the church, there is no salvation. People that are outside the Catholic Church will be saved not through their religion, but despite it. Uh, so even though someone is a Protestant or some other person outside the Catholic Church, they could still be saved. But, for example, if you're a Methodist, you might be saved, but you're not going to be saved because you're a Methodist. You're going to be saved despite the fact that you're a Methodist. If you're a Muslim, you're not, you're going, to, you're not going to be saved through your religion. You're going to be saved despite that. Remember, the Catholic Church recognizes Protestant baptism, most of them. Not all, but most of them. And, of course, the Church refers to them as ecclesial communities. Yeah. So, it's a little bit of a nuanced teaching, but it goes something like this. Every ecclesial community... Uh, has some shades of the truth. Meaning that, you know, obviously Protestantism has some shades of the truth because they broke away from the Catholic Church. They retained some essence of the truth. Uh, usually it's the, you know, the Holy Trinity, uh, the doctrine of Christ, the Redeemer, that sort of thing. Um, but they don't contain the, the whole truth. Um, because, well, why? Because they lack the guidance of, of the Church. They lack the, the Church being led by the Holy Ghost. Uh, so for someone to be saved in Protestantism or Islam or Buddhism, the religion itself is not going to save them, but God may, in His infinite mercy, choose to bring them to heaven despite their error in belief. Yeah. Uh, the question was, does the church believe that everyone outside the Catholic Church is going to hell? No, the church doesn't believe that. Who does the church believe is in hell? The church has never declared anyone to be in hell. That's, that's, that's the point. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is, we can't understand what God means by His infinite mercy. 
And, moreover, we can't judge the state of anyone's soul. Um, but the church has an obligation to tell people the truth, right? That's what we're talking about, doctrine, truth. Christ established the Catholic Church to proclaim this message to people. Uh, he didn't give us a book. He gave us a church. The church has promulgated a book called the Bible. But this is not the way that God decided to save people. He decided to save people through his church and this church's sacraments. So to be outside the church is to be away from the sacraments. What are the sacraments? The sacraments are the fonts of grace. So to be outside the church is to be away from the fonts of grace. What does grace do? Grace justifies us in the eyes of God. Therefore, it is logical that to be outside the church is to be away from God. Now, who is to bound the Holy Ghost, right? Not me. So it could be that in these ecclesial communities that we're talking about, the Holy Ghost is active. But in what way? In a way to lead people to truth. And what is truth? Truth is Christ. And what is Christ? Christ is His church. So to the extent the Holy Ghost is active in, other, in Protestant denominations, He is seeking to lead people to the Catholic Church. Yes, but they lack the interpreter, which is the church. The you cannot simply read the Bible and get to heaven that way. Protestants the Bible, Protestants. yeah. So, I mean, the Bible is important, yes. Uh, but in, to have an authentic interpreter of the Bible is more important. Because for the first 1,600 years or so, people couldn't read the Bible. Presumably they're in heaven. I know the church has proclaimed thousands of them to be. Okay. Uh, and so, what I'm saying here might sound like a harsh doctrine. This is the Catholic Church. The church has an obligation through me today to now proclaim this truth to you. Um, now, this has been nuanced a little bit in the church's teaching in terms of, um, obviously, most Protestants these days didn't say, you know, I have studied the Catholic Church and now, like Martin Luther, I'm disagreeing with it. I am a formal heretic. No. Um, people are born into Protestant religions and they may never know. People are born into indigenous tribes and they may never know. People are born to Mohammedism, and they may never know the truth of the Catholic Church. So we believe that God is merciful. He's going to be merciful in those people. They never had the opportunity to subscribe to the truth. But for those of us who believe the truth, if we were to fall away, we would be subject to judgment for that. That's the church's teaching. I want to point something out. Uh, on a number of occasions tonight, Mark has said, we don't believe that because it's illogical, or this is logical, that's why we believe it. A lot of agnostics, atheists, and philosophers of all stripes will say, oh, uh, Christianity, Catholicism, irrational. It is not. There is, we talk about theology, theologic. It is extremely rational and logical. If you accept God's revelation and believe in God the Father Almighty and what he teaches and what we're taught, uh, the, the church, the Catholic Church and its theology is the most internally consistent and logical theological system you'll ever find. Uh, yes, well, uh, St. Thomas is the theological. It, it is completely internally consistent and logical. So don't, don't, uh, don't let people put that off on you. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Well, oh, he had his hand up first, Buck, if you don't mind. Or do you have something specifically to that? Uh, not specifically okay. to that. Okay. Let me, let me go to, to him first and then we'll... Go ahead. Once more, um, what Catholics are called to believe about the serpent in Genesis. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I thought you said something kind of specific, but I want to make sure I understand. Yeah, great. Good. Regurgitate. Regurgitate, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we, we have to believe that the first man received a command from God to test his obedience, uh, and that through the temptation of the devil who took the form of a serpent, he transgressed the divine commandment. Let me, let me just elaborate on that, though, and this is, I think, kind of what you're maybe getting at. Your secondary question would be, do we have to believe that the devil took the form of a, like a snake? And the answer to that is no. We don't have to believe in any specific form of this serpent. Uh, some, I think Buck last week was talking about, you know, like a dragon or something like that, something really terrifying. Um, and so we don't have to hold to the literal word there because, uh, quite frankly, uh, well, this is the church's teaching, is that we're able to, you know, believe that these words uh, had a meaning to their author, their human author, um, and that their, the human author was basically describing things in language that he understood. I mean, he couldn't describe things in a language that he didn't know. Uh, and so, yeah, great question there. Buck. Likewise, going to go back to the preceding statement, that in Catholic, 
this is a cultural thing. This really has nothing to do with Catholic doctrine. And as a matter of fact, you could say that, even say that this stands in contrast to the true meaning of charity or the true Catholic doctrine. But the, the sort of cultural idea of Catholics being arrogant, well, we have the church and we're right, and if you don't agree with us, you're going to hell. Well, you know, there, there are a lot of falsehoods in that. You know, as Mark has just been talking about, you know, just because you're not Catholic doesn't mean you're going to hell. But also, if, if you find a Catholic who is smug about having the truth and being a member of the one true church, well, he himself is probably in danger of committing uh, either any or moral sins. Uh, yeah, I did not create the Catholic Church. I did not create its truths. I did not do anything to get myself into it or otherwise save myself from hell. And if I get all pride, prideful of the fact that I got the truth and you don't, you see the problem. Um, so a Catholic, by definition, believes that he has received through no merit of his own uh, the truth about God, uh, because God in his, uh, in his grace chose to give that Catholic the fullness of truth. And if that Catholic then starts getting all arrogant about, well, I got the truth and you don't, and, and, and poo poo, um, that is not charitable. Uh, it doesn't do anything to win people to but Yeah, you, know, you should accept this in a spirit of great humility and, and want to share the faith with others through. Um, who, through historical accident or birth or something else, have not so far been as fortunate as that. And since you mentioned charity, let me just uh, close on this issue by mentioning that. <clears throat> to allow people to live in a state of ignorance and away from God and away from His church, simply in an effort to be nice to them and to not criticize what they believe is not charity. The true charity of the church in terms of faith is to boldly proclaim that we have the truth. Please come over and join us. Everyone is welcome. That's true charity. Now, we should be humble about that, but we should not have a false humility about that. God has seen fit to choose us to be Catholic, and we should be very thankful for that. Uh, but yes, the inverse of this is not, you know, out, not the, the inverse of outside the church there's no salvation is that inside the church there is absolute salvation. <laughs> That is not true. Okay, so uh, well, I have this question here, which is a great, quest great couple of questions. Last week, the speaker said that it is a little t tradition for priests to be celibate. Could you clarify this term and explain the conditions under which a Catholic priest can be married? Sure thing, question asker. Uh, the church uh, could decide to allow uh, priests to not be celibate, presumably, um, although I doubt the church ever will. Uh, as that has been the long-standing little T tradition of the church now for like, uh, I don't know, 1,700 years. Um, but yes, the church could change that. Uh, in fact, in the, and this answers the second part of the question, in the Eastern rites of the Catholic Church, the priest can be married. Typically what happens is during the seminary, they, they, they will finish up maybe their diaconate, the first step to the priesthood, and then they will leave the seminary and go look for a wife. And then they'll get married and they come back and be ordained. The thing that can't happen is um, for a, a Latin Rite Catholic priest to be married, generally speaking. I'm not going to go into the nuances of the Anglicans and all that stuff. If, but if you encounter a married Catholic priest, an actual Latin Rite Catholic priest that's married, you know, presumably the bishop, if there was something wrong there, would know about it and would put the kibosh on it. Let's hope. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't going to go into that because that's too complicated. Yeah, yeah. Let's not worry about that. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's possible. It is possible. But. Yeah, the church would not allow that sort of thing. No. I've read it somewhere. It was a novel, so. Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh, the, Tom Clancy. It must be true. This, all right. So when a person nears death, is it essential, if I remember right, or it is essential, if I remember right, for them to receive the last rite, such as confession of sins? If one were to die in an accident suddenly and fail to receive pardon for their last sins, what happens to their soul? Do they go to purgatory hell? Oh, great question. Don't know. Um, yeah, so we should always try to live in a state of sanctifying grace. This is what we've been talking about, right? We should all, if we have mortal sin, we should go to confession be forgiven of the mortal sin. So we're back in a state of sanctifying grace so that if we die, we'll go to purgatory instead of hell. 
It is conceivable that if somebody had committed a mortal sin and then died, yes, I mean, you know, they've lost the sanctifying grace. They've lost their claim to, he to heaven. Um, and so, um, you know, at that point they're <coughs> presuming on God's mercy to try to go to heaven. Um, that's, the, that's the kind of the X factor is God's mercy. But yeah, normally when people are dying, they should receive the last rites. So, I mean, the, the Catholic Church, we're talking about the doctrine. The Catholic Church can be this easy, right? Be baptized, and uh, if you commit a mortal sin to go to confession, never commit a mortal sin again, you die, you go to heaven. You go to purgatory, which is the entrance way to heaven. That's, yeah. But if you're, if you're going to sleep at night, or if you feel you're dying, or something, Yes, there are, there are instances where if you said a, a, an act of contrition with a perfect contrition, um, that would suffice for confession. But that's not the, that would be what we would call an extraordinary means of forgiveness that one should not presume on. The ordinary means of forgiveness of sins is the sacrament of confession. So if you're going to die, you need to go to confession. Buck, I think you had to answer a question too. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, uh, at the same time, Go ahead. God gave Adam and Eve a challenge, and they chose to divide him. What does Satan have to do with that? It seems like God, the loving Father, offered the challenge, which would have been offered for generations until somebody took a bite. And with the generations after that live in original sin, while their cousins ran around gleefully in the knowledge of God, just like Catholics who are saved and knowing everybody else goes to hell. That was, well, that was my goal. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what's our um, God gave Adam and Eve, I want to say A and E, and I keep on thinking the TV network. Adam and Eve a challenge, and they chose to divide him. Yeah, correct, so far. What does Satan have to do with that? I would say that, uh, that Satan is, you help me out here. I don't want to say God's instrument, but that... Uh, God allows God, Satan to tempt. Yeah, God, God can use anyone and anything to his greater grace and to, to his greater good. Um, the, the idea of the permissive will of God. Uh, it seems like God, the loving Father, offered the challenge. Well, he did. He said, you know, this is good, this is bad. It's now up to you, uh, and you've got free will. Uh, and Satan, it, remember that Satan, I think I talked about this to at least somebody last, last week, Satan can't make you do anything. Uh, he, can, he can cajole, persuade, tempt. Uh, and so that was what was going on here. Um, uh, which would have been offered for generations until somebody took a bite. Well, the way that's phrased, oh, the way that's phrased, uh, it sounds like it's at some point somebody's got to give in to Satan. Uh, that's not true. Uh, that's not even true for us um, who suffer from original sin. It's certainly not true of somebody who doesn't have that concupiscence. You are always free to do the right thing. So, the, so it's kind of the wording is, it's a crapshoot, and at some point somebody's going to screw up. Well, insofar as that's true, and, it, and I don't think it is, it's true only because somebody chose of their own free will to screw up. Uh, there is nothing, in theory at least, and maybe more than in theory, preventing every single human being from ever live from living in the grace of God and avoiding original sin forever. Uh, now that we have concupiscence, uh, it is a lot harder because Adam's sin infected us all and has made sin much more attractive to us. Uh, so it is like playing with a loaded deck but, or, or loaded dice, but it's, it's still not a foregone conclusion that you're going to sin. It's still through your free will although that free will is now weakened somewhat, compromised. Um, and with the generations, and, and I think that's important for you to remember, let's make it personal, uh, that if you sin, there is no point in pointing to somebody who made you, forget Satan, just something else. Uh, well, social pressures, or the fact that I've had a bad day, or the fact that people were mean to me. No, you chose to do it. Maybe the conditions were such that made the choice a little easier, but you could have said no. So yeah, that's what makes a sin a sin. If you had no choice, it was not a sin. Um, 
And would the generations after that, let's say we get to generation 10 or something, and some of them fall and some of them don't, would the generations after that live in original sin while their cousins ran around gleefully in their knowledge of God? My guess would be that if one fell, just as Adam did, he would laterally uh, deform the entire, the entire race. It, it's human nature that gets messed up. And one thing that you'll find about the Catholic Church is that it is a very communal religion, that what one person does affects the entire community. Uh, a lot of you, um, uh, for coming from other traditions, know about the cross. You've got the, the vertical element, you've got the horizontal element. The vertical is how you relate to God, the horizontal is how we relate to each other. And so if one person screws up, it's going to be felt throughout the horizontal plane. You know, we're, we're all going to, uh, well, for instance, when you have a, a Catholic politician who publicly proclaims himself to be a Catholic while also publicly denigrating the teachings of his faith over and over and over again in public in front of the cameras, uh, that, that wounds the church. Uh, and the best example I have of this are Almost every major leading high-profile Catholic politician at the national level uh, proclaims himself to be pro-abortion, and yet proclaims himself to be Catholic. Uh, the, um, the only person that immediately comes to mind off the Supreme Court uh, is Rick Santorum, uh, who actually does follow the teaching of the church on that. But Ted Kennedy, who is now deceased, Joe Biden, uh, Nancy Pelosi, um, uh, John Kerry, uh, practically every major high-profile Catholic in Washington, D.C. Uh, is militantly pro-abortion. Uh, and yet they still claim themselves to be Catholic. And that puts me as a catechist, I'm sure Mark as a catechist, into the situation of trying to explain to them all, no, you cannot be Catholic and, and wish to legally allow your fellow human beings to kill other innocent human beings. You can't, you can't be Catholic and do that. Well, what do you know, Melton? I mean, they're high-profile people who have been Catholics their whole life. Well, I know what the church teaches. And I'm humble enough to at least try to accept that. So, there we are. Okay, anything else, anybody? 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 Okay, let's, let's say a prayer.